My name is Ken Brentner. They asked to give a little bit of a background, so I thought I'd do that. I'm a professor at Penn State University. I've been there 18 years, and I uh, perform research in uh, air acoustics, mostly helicopter noise prediction, but propeller uh, noise a little bit uh, lately, uh, aircraft noise and uh, wind turbine noise. Uh, I teach, of course, as well in aerospace engineering. Uh, I'm the author of a, I call it a Fox Williams Hawking Solver, a rotorcraft noise prediction code called PSU WAP WAP uh, at NASA Langley, where I worked 20 years. Uh, I wrote a code called uh, WAP WAP. It's not an acronym, it's just the sound it makes. Uh, um, so I joined Penn State in 2000. Uh, I worked at NASA Langley 17 years full time, 20 years counting my co op time. Uh, and uh, I did my PhD while I was at NASA at the University of Cambridge under the advice, uh, Sean Fox Williams was my uh, PhD advisor, so uh, I'm familiar, Ferry, Fer Ferry Ferrisat, uh, for those of you who might know him, uh, was my real mentor at NASA Langley and, and, and a longtime friend. So uh, the, the title it was a compromise that Brian and I came to. He had a more grandiose plan than I. I'm conservative extremely quiet propulsion. It's really all about propellers today. Uh, and uh, this is the outline of my presentation. I'm gonna give a little bit of uh, motivation. Uh, I think this group doesn't need to be too motivated. Theor some theoretical background, uh, not too deep, but I have to show equations, I'm a professor. Uh, th some historical background and examples. Then I'm gonna show uh, a bit of a parametric study towards the end and some concluding remarks. So uh, quiet uh, propulsion is important um, because of, we have to have these vehicles certified uh, in some form or the other. Uh, right now there's civil certification for the FAA uh, or ICAO. Uh, there's going to be probably local regulations or restrictions, even though the FAA would rather not that happen, but there will be. Uh, community and passenger acceptance is going to be very, very important. Uh, sometimes we forget about passenger acceptance, but if people don't want to ride in the vehicles, it won't matter very much either. So we have to worry about exterior and interior noise. And of course, all that comes down to a competitive advantage of one vehicle is quieter than another, and people prefer riding that, or people prefer buying that vehicle, that's important. And noise often can be a, a distinctive factor. Now, the new technologies provide new opportunities and new challenges. So a couple things are distributed electric or propulsion, small UAVs or drones. Um, we could talk about other things as well, uh, but these all have propellers. So I had a slide like this already ready. These aren't all particularly new, but in distributed electric propulsion, uh, there's, there's several new opportunities here, lots of Lots of propellers on these vehicles. They can have low tip speeds. Um, I know they've flown a vehicle, but it's a concept vehicle, and this one looks, this, this uh, artist rendition looks nicer than their, what they've flown. Uh, so we've got lots of things. They have many propellers. They can have acoustic and aerodynamic interaction. They typically will have low tip Mach numbers, which is good. They could have variable RPM, either intentional or unintentional. Um, rotating propeller axes if they have tilt rotors on them and installation effects, those could be an issue. Uh, these kind of vehicles also are, are vehicles that uh, we won't really talk about today, but are electric and have issues with noise. Uh, these are also uh, vehicles we have to concern are very similar. Uh, in addition to the other problems, they have low Reynolds numbers because it's typically small size high angular rates uh, of velocity, they can rapidly maneuver and other things, and, and that'll cause unsteadiness, uh, potentially high noise, and they're also close to you, variable RPM, uh, flow interactions with the airframe and other things. These are, uh, are things that we have to worry about. So before, let's talk a little bit about theoretical background then, and, and what are some things important to noise. So propeller noise is something that's been studied for a long time. Uh, Guten was uh, one of the first uh, back in the 30, 36. Uh, his paper was translated by NACA in 48. 
uh, and he uh, worked in the frequency domain and computed harmonics of acoustic pressure for stationary propellers. And, and the, the idea was he could replace the effect of the blade forces by a, a distribution of oscillating forces on the propeller. And, and so steady loading noise is sometimes still referred to uh, as Guten noise. Now, this, I, I've uh, chained, I've flipped this image from his original paper so it matches my coordinate system. But here was a prediction of the first harmonic for a two-bladed uh, propeller. Here, here was an experiment of the time, and you can see it agreed pretty well, uh, the sound pressure level. Th this is the directivity, so this is the direction of flight. Uh, this was the angle theta zero, 180. Uh, and the, my angles are going to be a little bit different, but as you go around, this is the amplitude of the sound pressure level. Uh, so this would be 90 degrees is in the plane of the rotor. Uh, and so the second and higher harmonics didn't agree as well, but the sound power was okay. This was, this was uh, done a long time ago, but pretty, pretty uh, good results uh, for the time uh, without too much information. The other type of noise source that's important uh, was uh, done by Ernst Hausen and Deming was thickness noise, the fact that the propeller blades have finite thickness and the air has to move out of the way. They independently uh, came up with this, and this can be important. Uh, I don't want to talk too much about this. Usually for propellers, the loading noise is higher. Uh, I work in rotorcraft noise, and thickness noise is very important for propeller or for helicopter rotors, especially at high speed. For 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 um, propellers with relatively high tip speeds, the thickness noise can be quite important. Uh, I'm going to show you it's not quite as important for propellers with low tip speeds. Um, but even in the early calculations, I've I've uh, Put, highlighted the experiment of the blue lines and the theory is the red dash lines, uh, the first four harmonics, same kind of directivity. They agreed pretty well back then, uh, given the fact that their measurement technology wasn't nearly as good as we have today. Uh, you know, that would be pretty good for a designer even today to get that close. So let's talk a little bit about the different noise sources that are possible or, or that we have to worry about. There's really two types of noise that we can have. We can classify as discrete frequency noise, noise that uh, you could think of as tonal or, or uh, non-random noise, and then broadband noise are two general categorizations. Uh, thickness noise, I, I sort of have this schematic where the air has to move out of the way, uh, and then loading noise. Uh, where there's a, a loading distribution, uh, a force distribution over our, our blades, and, and as, the, as the, its accelerating force is moving, uh, that'll cause noise to radiate, and of course, because the blades are rotating, even if it's steady in the blade frame, uh, it'll be uh, accelerating in the, in the fluid fixed frame or the frame of the observer. Uh, now, loading noise includes things like a helicopter's blade vortex interaction. It also includes unsteady loading noise uh, from other unsteady sources, uh, even non-deterministic sources like turbulence uh, sources. So broadband noise uh, is really a type of loading noise where we have turbulence ingested uh, into the rotor, the propeller or helicopter rotor, or self-noise, where we have uh, unsteadiness in the boundary layer uh, going past the trailing edge. Um, but unsteady noise, I'm going to not talk, I'm going to talk about it a bit. Uh, I'm really concerned that people pay attention to inter interactions between, say, propellers or between an airframe. This is where you can really uh, screw up your, your noise if you don't pay attention to that. You can have low tip speeds and everything else, but if you have extra unsteady loading, uh, that can be bad. High speed impulsive noise is something we talk about in helicopters. When we get shock waves, transonic flow, uh, usually we have this on edgewise rotors. Uh, we can get shock waves on propellers, but we're not going to be taught, we're not going to operate there in these vehicles. 
Uh, we could have quadrupole noise too and, and high speed propellers, but we're not going to be interested in that, so I'm not going to talk about it today. So those are the type of noise sources. Today we use an equation called the Fox Williams Hawking's equation that I spent most of my career working with. We really rearrange the governing equations of fluid mechanics and we force it in, this is, this is a wave operator, we force it into a wave equation. Everything that doesn't fit into the wave equation ends up being these source terms over here, which are thickness and loading and the quadrupole noise. So we have, this is an exact rearrangement of the, the governing equations and we get these source terms from some other place, usually computational fluid mechanics now, but it could be from measurements as well. Now, then Ferrisat uh, came up with an integral formulation of the Fox Williams Hawkins equation. This is most widely used. Uh, he would say, I'm impressing you with showing you all this. I don't want you to pay attention to the details. I just want you to know that we have this. But uh, there's terms here. Uh, let me go forward one. Uh, the terms with the, in blue, V and M, uh, these are terms associated with velocity. The terms with R, these are associated with distance. And the terms with L, in green, the L's are, are uh, loading terms. So we have uh, blade loading and blade motion are, are things we need for noise prediction. The, the terms with dots are time derivatives. So we have to pay attention to how are things changing in time. That's where unsteady loading comes in. The one minus MR, by the way, up here are Doppler factors uh, in there. So these, all these things come uh, from external codes, or we could use theories or approximations, and the acoustic results depend upon their accuracy. So in fact, we can early in design have theory or approximations and still get relatively good predictions. And I'm going to show you some results where we're doing that. So let me show you some historical examples. First of all, these are quite interesting, I think, and I, I want to put things into context. So, so clear back in the 40s again, after, just right after these papers were translated, uh, this, was, this was a paper, uh, an ACA report uh, by Vogley. Uh, they had a reconnaissance aircraft uh, here. Uh, and, and they modified this aircraft to take advantage of things they learned from the theory, uh, reduce the tip speed by uh, using gearing to reduce the RPM. Uh, then, of course, they had to modify the propeller to, to generate enough thrust at that reduced RPM. So they had five blades, and you can see the, the solidity or activity factor is, is, is higher here. Um, they had a muffler, you can just see it here, and a different cowling uh, for this aircraft. And, and in fact, this was interesting to me, the pilots uh, commented that the, the performance was slightly better on this uh, propeller for a 96 inch diameter, the original was 85 inch, and just slightly less performance for the same uh, diameter as the two bladed propeller. So how did it do for noise? Well, here's uh, overall sound pressure level versus airspeed on this aircraft, and this is the unmodified original aircraft. And, and then for the modified aircraft, this is the level they got. So somewhere around 15 decibel noise reduction. What's important is, is when the, when the power was off, they were only probably about four or five decibels uh, above that with the, uh, the modified aircraft. So they're very close to the noise floor, if you will. Now probably we could d design a quieter, unpowered airplane today, but they were getting pretty close to it. This is in the 1940s. Uh, a another generation later in the Vietnam era, uh, started with a glider uh, for the Army and then uh, became the Army Lockheed YO-3A, Quiet Star, uh, they developed an aircraft, again, with the same idea, uh, six-bladed propeller, low tip speed. They used uh, uh, just enough power, low power engine, slow-turning propeller. They had a belt drive to drive this propeller, six-bladed propeller. Uh, asymmetrical exhaust system. Uh, it had a, a, a special exhaust 
a muffled system and, and cooled the air. And, and they flew this aircraft only at night. It was never visible in the daytime, and its only uh, thing that kept it safe was its stealth. And it, was, it could fly at night 250 to 500 meters silently. And uh, it owned the sky at night, and they could fly over the Viet Cong and see what they're doing. Um, NASA Ames had a vehicle they used for flight testing. Later years, they, uh, I think even in Vietnam, they, they changed the propeller to a, a three-bladed design and didn't see much difference in performance. I think one was fixed pitch and, and one was variable. So uh, shortly in 1974, there's a paper where they tried to look at why they couldn't predict this. Uh, so this is the experimental data uh, for that aircraft. This is various RPM. This is the sound pressure level for a, for a harmonic. Uh, this, this data was the Air Force noise prediction code. Didn't have the right trend, wrong levels. They were trying to figure out why. So they first did a prediction with uh, axisymmetric flow, quite far off. Then they added the fact that, well, this was really flying at angle of attack. Ah, that's starting to get the right shape and much closer level. And then they realized that, well, the wake of the propeller is impinging upon the wing, and there's unsteady loading on the wing. And when they included that, they're actually getting quite close. So back in the 70s, they understood this fairly well. In fact, this, this conclusion is consistent with a recent uh, UAV noise test for a small drone at NASA Langley by Zawadney and Boyd where the, the uh, wake on a cone of a, of a UAV was about 25% of the noise source. So the key variables, and I'm not talking all of them here, but the real big ones are we want to have low tip speed, larger number of blades, lower disc loading. Uh, I do want to point out, you can, if you do all these, they don't necessarily all add up. And give, if you do all of them at once, you might not get incrementally uh, addition. You, you, you might not get all of the same addition, at least. The challenges are unsteady loading, uh, things like yaw or angle of attack, or worse, interactions with other propellers or the airframe, including wakes into the propeller. Uh, that can be very serious, or the propeller too close to something, or turbulence in the boundary layer, or acoustic interactions between propellers or scattering by the airframe. So now I want to show you uh, a, a parametric study we did, uh, just simple to show you some of these effects. So for this, we used a reference aircraft, a modern aircraft, a Tecfum P-2012. It's a modern twin-engine aircraft, six to nine passengers. Um, I don't really need to talk too much about the aircraft because we didn't really use any of it. What we did, though, is use the size of the propeller and the thrust of the propellers to, to set our reference scale. And then we, didn't, we used that and we designed our own propeller with X, X rotor so we wouldn't actually be using the same propeller. We picked a, a, a flight condition, level flight. Uh, the total thrust for this condition is 5,600 newtons for both propellers, 100 knots uh, forward flight speed. This uh, baseline case had three propellers, or, or three, three blades per propeller, two propellers, tip speed of, of Mach 0.7, uh, a radius, and this is just the rotational tip speed, radius of 1.05 meters and 16.9 pounds, pounds per square foot uh, disc loading. Now I'll show um, noise uh, observer positions 30 meters from the propeller hub, and they move with the aircraft, so they're fixed in relative to the aircraft. So if we look at the baseline propeller, uh, now we're looking at a side view. Uh, so here's the propeller. Uh, this is in front of the aircraft. That'll be a uh, theta of 180 degrees. This is behind the aircraft. The this will be in the plane of the propeller. And you can see I I've plotted the thickness loading and the most important is total, the black line. Uh, it's, it's highest noise in the plane of the propeller. It's, it's essentially zero. 
uh, or very low in the axis of the propeller. I don't have turbulence and other things here. It's, it's axisymmetric flow. Uh, this is acoustic pressure versus time for one ro rotation of the propeller at different azimuth positions here at zero or 180 uh, on around. This is 270 directly below. Here's at 360 or zero. And you can see uh, we have the highest amplitude signal uh, in front and back, it's essentially negligible. There's three pulses because it's a three-bladed propeller. So this is the, the raw signal that we actually calculate and we then uh, post-process it to get the overall sound pressure level. Now then we uh, model in a simple way unsteady loading, and this is really the simplest type of unsteady loading I could do is do a quasi-steady modeling uh, approximating uh, loading at angle of attack. So if we have the propeller at an angle of attack, and I've got the propeller on its side, there's some component in the plane of the propeller as well as on the axis. And what that does is on this side of the propeller, this, this component adds to the velocity omega r, and on this side it subtracts from it. Here and here it doesn't do anything. And, and so we get an increase in loading as it goes around, decrease. And we used X-Rotor to calculate the loading by calculating 30 times around, and we calculate the loading, for the steady loading at each point, and then we combine them together to get an unsteady loading, a quasi-steady analysis. So you can see how it's changing, and this is, this is exaggerated for, for visualization. So how does that change the noise? Well, here is a case with 10 degrees angle attack. This is, this is the case I showed you before. And you can see it tilts this a bit. Uh, you can see this feature of the loading noise is changed as well as here. Uh, the amplitude's changed here. It's hard to tell on this scale. This scale, I wanted to show all the features. But it's changed between 2 and 4 dB uh, in levels. Not a lot, but, uh, but significant. And, and it's, it's rotated, and so we have to pay attention. Again, this is the most kind of benign loading change we could have uh, at angle of attack. Then I've done the same thing here, but now I've plotted three different tip speeds, Mach 0 0.7, 0 0.4, and 0 0.3. Now notice the propellers aren't the same because essentially to be viable, we have to redesign the propellers for each case. And we did that. This is a little different than we often do. They all have to have the same thrust. And this is the different angles of attack. And what you can see is uh, at difference, there's not a huge change with angle attack here and, and unsay loading. We have a, a big drop off in the noise as we lower the tip speed for all cases. At the lower tip speeds, the unsteady loading per perhaps has higher effect, especially here, I would say, at 0.3. The other thing to notice is how the, the, uh, the thickness noise, the red, red falls off faster with tip speed than the loading noise. Now here's the effective number of blades. Uh, again, uh, we had four blades, six blades, 12 blades. Everything's kept constant. In fact, the, the, the total blade area is kept constant, so the blades get skinnier. Uh, notice here, let's just focus on zero degrees, or st the steady case. Um, from four, six to eight blades, we have a significant reduction in noise in the plane of the rotor. And as we go to the unsteady loading, this is at Mach 0.4, because I want to look at lower tip speeds in the rest of the talk. And you can see the unsteady loading maybe has more effect now uh, at this lower tip speed than it did before. But changing the number of blades has a big effect. Uh, but I'm getting very skinny blades, probably not a, a, you know, a well-designed propeller at this stage. The next thing I looked at is let's consider having different number of propellers. So here I looked at one propeller versus uh, two, like in this configuration, four or six. These are the, the spacing of them along the wing. Uh, if we look at the side view, there's not a lot of difference, although we get, you know, close to four 
dB variation, and 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 one and one propeller and six are about the same, so it's not a, necessarily a linear variation. And then uh, from the side view, we get quite a, a interference effect. This, the black is one propeller, and uh, depending on the other. If I go forward, uh, we get looks pretty similar, except we have uh, some change. But if I go back and forth, you can actually see there's, there, there is quite a bit of variation uh, as we go forward uh, with unsteady loading. So the last case I did here was let's look at the, the disc loading. Now in this case I kept the number of blades, uh, three blades in each case, which made for pretty wide cords uh, for, for the 16 pounds per square foot, which I've had before. Then I went to four pounds and, and uh, Brian seemed to like 0.9, so I did that for him. And, and as we changed to very low disc loadings, we had quite a bit of reduction in, in uh, noise. So all of those, we can reduce the noise quite significantly. So then let's talk, let's kind of conclude. And so this, is, this isn't your typical concluding remarks. I'll have one more slide. But I said, let's do a fun exercise. And Brian, I did this one for you. So let's, let's take the Technum with a low tip speed, low disc loading propeller, and let's compare it to this reconnaissance aircraft. So I put two propellers, and I said, let's go tip speed of Mach 0.2. Let's go down to, not 0.9, let's go to four pounds per square foot uh, low, disc loading, and that gives us a radius of 2.16 instead of 1.05 meters. And same for, forward speed, uh, instead of 51.14 meters per second, it's 115 miles per hour, so I can put it on this plot. And I'll just remind you, this was the original two-bladed, this was their modified blade, and if I do this for the Technum with this setup, well, here's where the uh, noise is, 26.5. Now, this is uh, qu much quieter than the airframe, and I think we could do, our airframe would be quieter today. And this is surely uh, unrealistically optimistic. Uh, there's, there's sources we've left out, uh, and it probably wouldn't be this quiet. But this gives us a target, I think, uh, to talk about. So in conclusion, propeller noise is, is well understood and we can predict it and we've been able to do for a long time. The aerodynamics can give us the key features. Unsteady aerodynamics is really important and it's especially important for low tip speeds. In fact, people that work on fans, cooling fans and computers and other things with really low tip speeds, they don't even worry about what we call steady sources. They only worry about the unsteady loadings and turbulence. So the key is low tip speeds, low increased number of blades, low disc lead. We need to eliminate as much as we can unsteady interactions. Blade thickness isn't nearly as critical at low tip speeds, so we, we don't need to worry about that quite as much as at higher tip speeds. And I think more consideration, we need to pay more attention to turbulence ingestion, broadband uh, noise sources, and we probably need to pay more attention to acoustic scattering and I haven't really talked about those much in the talk, but those, those are going to be important too. So, with that, I don't know if there's any time left. I really appreciate your last slide. That was, that was a treat. Um, I wonder if the problem that's going to limit the super low noise is going to be that the blades become so skinny that uh, they start to wobble or flutter. But the other, but the real question the I want to... The answer is no on that. Okay. I, I'm almost certain that's not the case. The problem is going to be unsteady aerodynamics, unsteady loading from lots of sources. And, uh, and, and the wing interaction, if you have a tractor prop on a nacelle out in front of the wing, is there a, a sweet spot where, thanks to the low vibration of electric motors, you can put the motor prop very far forward of the wing on a long tubular nacelle and thereby get away from the swirl interaction to the wing and cut the noise? Is, is there going to be a helpful 
sweet spot in that design? Well, that'll be helpful in the acoustic design, but the, there's, there's aircraft designers here that can tell you about if that's feasible because that'll get into all the other things about uh, balance, weights and balance and, and, and trim of the aircraft and everything. But, but I, I'm not very worried about the thinness of the blades because I don't think, because we don't need to make them so thin from a noise point of view. That's not the, going to be the primary thing. Uh, but, but, but I am very concerned about a lot of what I've seen is people putting rotors really close to things. They're, they're ignoring the knowledge we have. And, and, and that's why I've been sending the message as I have is let's not, pay, let's not ignore all this experience we have. I know that there's a lot of peop people, people that aren't, and, but there's a lot more that are ignoring it. And that's what I worry about most. What about noise in electric ducted fans? Um, okay, I, I'm not an expert on ducted fans. Um, but what I'll tell you, there's two things I see people talking about is things that are all called short shrouds. If you've got a low, a low tip speed rotor in a very short shroud that doesn't really act with a duct, it's not, you're not going to take advantage of shielding and duct acoustics like you might think. And, and yet uh, people that don't do analysis are maybe claiming things. If it's, a, if it's a proper duct that has enough length and the wavelengths and things are, are, are um, uh, such that you can use liners and things, I think then that, that would be okay. Uh, but I'm, I can't say too much more than that. I think you have to, you, but you can't ignore duct acoustics and, and, and the proper things. A lot of people are selling things. I, I know in helicopters, things like fenestrons, which are kind of look like ducted tail rotors, they are not quieter. They are noisier. And so just because you put something there doesn't mean it's going to be quieter. Um, you had a slide on distributed propulsion, and I didn't quite get the conclusion of that. Maybe you could go back to that and talk to that. But the um, did you end up finding an optimum for a particular no, configuration? No, I, I, I didn't even try to find an optimum. The only thing I did close to it was, was this, is that with this configuration, these configurations, you get interference patterns. Um, uh, they change with angle of attack a little bit. Uh, if you change them, if you don't make them in a plane, they're going to change. I, I think you've got to be a little bit careful taking that, using that too much because with angle attack and stuff since they change, you can get some benefit, but I, I, I worry that you, you might not be able to get as much benefit as some people might try to claim. You, you know, let me just, so see how they uh, focus on this one and look at from, with 10 degree angle attack, how some of those patterns change. So if you're counting on a particular pattern, say the, the red dash line or the other, and, and then now you go into a climb or you go into yaw, it's going to change on you. So you can get some benefit, but you might not get as much all the time as you can. Can you model the effects of a sweat blade? Are you doing any research on that? Sweat blades tend to be appropriate for higher tip speeds. So uh, at low tip speeds, you, you won't see much benefit from sweat blades. Uh, in wind turbines, for example, uh, at low speeds, they, they don't see any, any, any benefit. Uh, 